So we start art history here um, in chapter one with Paleolithic and Neolithic art. Every class I tend to give you a map of the slides or a map of where we're looking at art from because um, it just kind of helps you visualize what life is like for the people who made the art. So we're going to look at art in France mostly in the southern part of France, in the northern part of Spain, uh, in Austria, in the northern part of Austria, and in the southern part of Germany. Um, when we get to Neolithic art, of course, the big famous work of art is Stonehenge um, in Salisbury. And then we'll look at a few things from Ireland. This is a three million year old pebble. It is evidence that Paleolithic people developed the use of tools. Um, you can see that a drill has been used here to create the divots in the pebble, um, to create the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Um, the pebble really goes beyond the recognition of the human face um, to represent a human and animal form. Um, your textbook states that the immensity of this achievement cannot be overstated. And if you were in a live class, I would ask you, why do you think that this was an important achievement? What do you think it is that is so important about this three million year old pebble and why would Gardner put it in the textbook as being one of the very first works of Western art I want you to think about that one and we will come back to it this is one of the oldest paintings that we have record of um, it is in the, it's from Nambia, Africa, and it was excavated in a cave that we have found five of these portable paintings. Artists begin to ask the question, what is my subject matter and how should I represent it? So if we stop and go back to that three million year old pebble, or we look at the painting that was found in a cave in Nambia, one of the things that we realize is that art had to be small and it had to be portable. Why? Well, right now, the Paleolithic people spend a lot of their time chasing their food source. So they're not um, able to domesticate crops yet. They don't live off of the land in terms of vegetation. What they do live off of though is the bison that travel from um, one area to another or herding animals of some sort that travel from one area to another. Those herding animals, the Paleolithic people follow. They're a migratory group of people and if they're going to make something artistic, it would be something that they would want to be able to carry with them because they're constantly moving. Age range um, for the average Paleolithic person, I believe, was 14 or 15 years old. Please don't quote me on that. It's been a minute since anthropology class. Um, but they didn't have a whole lot of downtime. They didn't have a whole lot of time to spend creating art. Um, the fact that the water-worn pebble was picked up by an artist and tools were used to create divots in the pebble that resembled a human face says that humankind is starting to ask itself questions. It's starting to recognize 
um, the opportunity to represent something in visual form because they don't have a lot of t they don't have a lot of time because they spend their time chasing the herd. Uh, most of their energy is spent hunting, and when your life is about feeding yourself and reproducing, um, the hours and hours it takes to create a highly specialized work of art just isn't there. However, they do have time for perhaps a quicker drawing um, or a quick painting like this one. Uh, this one's titled The Animal Facing Left from the Apollo 2 cave in Nambia. Um, and not only do we see the creative question of what is my subject, we see the creative question of how do I want to represent my subject and what do I want to represent my subject on. Uh, so all of a sudden the artist is asking himself about media. What is it that I'm going to use to create my work of art? Am I going to use paint? Am I going to use uh, charcoal? Am I going to use uh, vegetation around me? Um, they also begin to say, what do I want to paint on the rock? In this case, it's some sort of animal. Um, we don't have enough detailed information to positively say it's a cat. Some people say it's a bear, even though bear's legs tend to be a little bit um, bulkier and a little bit more um, massive. Um, but most people look at this animal and think it's a cat of some sort. So then the question becomes, why a cat? Why do they feel the need to represent um, these type of cats? Why represent it in a sideways form? Um, stop and think for a minute. What? Stop and see if you can come up with an answer to my question for a moment. So since we're not in live class, I can't ask you to raise your hand and tell me what you came up with. Um, but what I'm hoping you came up with would have been, it's easiest to get the most amount of information by representing the animal from a side profile view. Um, the animal's looking forward. Um, we, the viewer, look at the animal from the side and there are a couple of advantages to representing the animal from a, the side. For one thing, we can see that the animal has four legs. All four legs can be represented if the animal's uh, walking or posing in a way that the legs are separated. Um, we also could possibly see details um, of maybe what the fur looks like or what kind of um, facial features the animal has by representing him sideways. Now this particular piece doesn't show exactly what the animal's teeth look like or what the animal's head really looks like in detail, but we do get the idea that it's an animal that walks on all four. We're pretty sure it's a mammal of some sort um, and possibly an animal that had great power in society. Um, the fact that the animal exists on this rock in a painting would mean that there is some sort of importance to the artist who created the animal. Most scholars come up with the idea that there really isn't a subject matter that would have been represented other than something that's associated with religion because they are chasing the herd so much and they're confronted a lot with death. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in front of a real bison, but they're kind of scary. Uh, large herding animals usually have large horns. Um, and it usually takes a good amount of people to take one down to feed their family. So a bison 
cooked raw meat could last a group of people upwards of three months. So it would give them the opportunity to catch something and stay stationary um, with uh, because they caught this particular animal. Um, or I'm sorry, because they caught a bison. So we don't know if the rock was all one slate at one time and it got broke maybe in transport of carrying it around um, or if the rock uh, was in two pieces in the first place. The other thing we don't know is exactly why they chose this particular subject. Um, time is a great resource at this point in time and for an artist to sit down and make a painting like this means that the thing that they're representing had to have had significant meaning. We think it could have had to do with their religion or it could have had to do with education of the group members about the dangers of animals. Um, we just don't know. This is the oldest sculpture ever found. Um, and it was, it's considered sculpture in the round, meaning that the artist had no specific intended viewpoint for the viewer to look at the art. Um, so we, we call that sculpture in the round. Um, this is also an anamorphic power figure, meaning that the figure takes on human and animal-like qualities. Uh, the most uh, popular anamorphic figure in American society that I can think of is Mickey Mouse. Uh, Mickey Mouse has qualities of an animal, qualities of a mouse, but also has human-like qualities. He walks bipedally, you, he has emotions, he smiles, uh, and he talks. In this case, uh, the sculpture has the head of a lion or a bear and the body of a man. Um, he walks upright bipedally uh, and has some similar muscle structure to that of a warrior. This particular work is currently in a museum in Germany and we think he was likely a leadership symbol. Uh, because he combines the human form with the form of a lion. That's why we said he was an anamorphic power figure. Um, oftentimes, societies would utilize an animal that was very powerful to them and align themselves as a community with that powerful animal. So in this case, a lion. Um, because the lion is a very powerful animal, it has strength, it's very heavy, it kills uh, prey, it's a strong hunter. Um, those things are all things that the community would have valued, uh, especially the strong hunting, because remember, they're running around trying to catch their food. And so um, here you see an anamorphic power figure. Uh, they utilize the lion because they look at it as a powerful figure. Um, and they combine the lion qualities with the human qualities. Why would they want to combine lion qualities with human qualities? Well, we think it is because this work of art represents uh, a powerful individual in society or a powerful individual uh, that they worshipped in society. We likely think that this work of art represents a society that has um, strong leadership system. We know that it represents a society that likely had a caste system. A caste system means that there were a group of people that were superior to others there was a group of people that served that superior person or being 
Um, and then a group of people who were at the lower end of the rank who were probably running around chasing food. Um, we know that the culture or community that created this work of art was very skilled with tools. Here you can see a close-up of the texture of the work of art. It is made of bone, um, and so an artist would have had to have spent quite a bit of time carving the work of art. Uh, you can see on the detailed image that I've showed you that the uh, arm has incising in it. Incising is the term that we use to describe those scratches that are across his arm. Um, those could have been a record of battles that were won against other communities. They could have been a record that um, meant the leader had lived or killed a certain amount of game. It is hard to say. Um, but the indentations were done with a tool that we call a burin um, that cut into the surface of the sculpture. Um, it was a way to decorate the sculpture, but it also told us interesting information um, about their um, power system. Um, the incising is representative of something in their power system, but so is the fact that uh, the lion is combined with the human. The lion is a powerful animal, and the human would like to take on those lion-like qualities to be looked at as powerful. Um, we see in the face of the sculpture that the community or artist who created him uh, had a good, solid knowledge of how to use Stone Age tools. Uh, a drill would have been used to create the divot in, for the eye. A file would have been used to flatten the nose area so that uh, it had a nice boxy shape. Um, a file would have also been used to create the separation of the lower jaw and the upper jaw. Um, and I told you a burin would have been used to create the incising. This is the Venus of Willendorf. She is dated 28,000 to 25,000 BCE. Um, and she was found in Willendorf, Austria, which is why she's titled uh, the Venus of Willendorf. She's a Venus figure. Uh, that means a woman who has curvy hips and a large bust. Uh, popular Venus figures in today's society would be like uh, Jessica Rabbit, Betty Boop, um, I think even Madonna sort of plays up that Venus figure uh, stereotype. She is a fecundity symbol. Um, We don't think that the artist was aiming for a natural representation of the human figure when creating this work of art. We do think at one time she had lower legs and feet, but they may have broken off. She is an example of what we call a closed form statue. Closed form statue is a statue where appendages don't uh, project from the sculpture. Uh, why would you want to create a closed form statue over a open form statue where the legs or arms project away from the statue? It is because it makes them vulnerable, uh, the statue vulnerable to losing the arms or legs to breakage um, when the statue would be carried around. We know that um, she has some strange proportions to her, and we know that they had really good command over Stone Age tools. You can see in the head covering that she wears, uh, expert use of that Stone Age drill to create those little divots. 
um, use of the drill to create the holes in the breasts for the nipples and the large belly button. We also see that a file would have been used to extract material around the pelvic line um, so that the pelvic triangle could be emphasized. We think at one time she had lower legs and feet, uh, but we think they have broken off from being carried around. Her arms fit tightly at her bust, uh, right across the top of her, her chest. And she has quite a bulbous belly. We know that she's post-childbearing. In our society today, we would look at her as being obese. But in their society, she would have been the ideal woman. Um, she is faceless. The head covering completely covers the face. We know that they had the research and technology to create textiles at this time because of the uh, head covering. Now, when I say create textiles, you might be thinking they knew how to create a large piece of fabric. That's not the case at all. Um, it was more that they could take plant material and weave it or knot it in a certain way that created a textile or head covering. Um, there are scholarly debates about the Venus of Willendorf and her purpose in Paleolithic society. Some scholars think that she might have been used for worship um, or to encourage fertility amongst her people. Uh, she might have been used to as a way to um, center women on having children. Uh, she may have been considered the ideal beautiful woman in her society. We do know that her arms are placed above her breast, which seems to infer that maybe she doesn't use her arms all that much. Um, and I would say most of the scholars that I have talked to feel that this particular statue represents a deity. Um, a deity would have an ideal representation of a body form. Uh, you have to remember that the life expectancy was very short at this given point in time. Women who got pregnant, some, or women who were pregnant, sometimes didn't make it through childbirth. Um, if they were lucky enough to have completed childbirth, sometimes the child didn't survive. My point here is that the mortality rate was pretty high and the lifespan was not very long. And so based on their society's challenges of hunting for food, um, this particular work of art has a lot of very skilled evidence of skilled um, tool usage, but also evidence of um, specialized skill in sculpting. And so we think that in order to create a work of art that had this much time spent creating it, it is likely that it was a work of art that represented something to do with their belief in the afterlife. Um, give me a second. I'm just checking my notes to make sure that I told you everything. We know that she didn't represent a particular woman in society because she has a head covering. We can't see her face. Uh, she doesn't represent uh, my mom or my grandma or my sister or my child. Because she does not have a face. Um, the fact that she doesn't have a face has pushed scholars further into thinking that she was a representation of the ideal female. Um, that their focus on what made an ideal or beautiful female had to do with her ability to reproduce. 
her voluptuousness pushes the idea that she was had something to do with their belief system in the afterlife um, because women in their society didn't typically look like this. Um, I doubt that they ever really saw a woman that had this much uh, body fat because they didn't stay in one place very long. Um, they migrated, they walked a ton, and so this would have been a representation of something that they had never seen before. Uh, and so that's why we think that it had something to do with what they believed in the afterlife. We see um, some interesting exceptions to the idea of the Venus figure. Uh, this is another Venus figure. It's a head of a woman. Uh, you can see the representation of that textile use here, as well as you can see the mastery of the tools. Um, you can see the mastery of the file, particularly in the brow ridge that's created and the nose. Um, and the use of the burin to create the incising for the head covering. Uh, this particular work of art, we say, has a bigger representation of naturalism. The idea that um, this is more what a woman would have looked like in real life because she's thin. Um, we could infer from this uh, representation that the head of a woman is from an area that was warm. The Venus of Willendorf was found in Austria. She needed all that body fat in order to survive a winter, in order to survive the harsh conditions in which the people or community lived in. Um, whereas the head of the woman that you're looking at here is quite slender and has an elongated neck. And so we could infer that she came from a warmer climate. When you compare the two works of art, the Venus of Willendorf and the woman, the head of a woman, you can see the stark contrast between how they probably worked within society. Scholars believe that both works of art were um, representations of ideal beauty, and scholars believe that they were both Venus figures. So I want you to stop here, pause a minute, and do a writing exercise. Do a compare and contrast. See if you can come up with three things between these two works of art that are the same and three things between these two works of art that are different. So what do we know about the Paleolithic people? Well, one of the biggest things we know is that they had tools and they were able to use them. We know that they were hunters and gatherers. Um, and we know that their art had to be portable or contained in a prime central location. We call the group of people that we study in the Paleolithic times in art history Stone Age people because their tools were made of stone. Here you can see a drawing of the tools that they had. They had a leaf shaped tool that had two sides to it. They had a um, shouldered point tool that could have been used for cutting. It could have been used as a drill. And then they had a laurel point tool that was used, used more as a flat um, shape for a filing purpose.
This work of art is called The Human Holding Bison Horn from La Salle. We're moving to the cave system of southern France. And it was done 25,000 to 20,000 BCE. Um, human holding a bison horn, or we also call her the Lady of La Salle, is a relief carving. A relief carving is a carving that is done on a flat surface in which the artist extracts material from the surface and um, leaves behind a sculpture. It is attached to a surface. The difference between the Venus of Willendorf and this particular sculpture is that one is a relief sculpture and one is a freestanding sculpture. Um, these relief sculptures were often found at the entrance to caves. In this case, this sculpture was found at the entrance to the cave at La Salle, France. The way she sculpted leads art historians to believe that she was possibly a fertility symbol, just like the Venus of Willendorf. She has those nice wide hips with a prominent pelvic triangle, those weird short little arms again. Uh, she kind of looks like the T-Rex of the uh, Paleolithic women. Um, she holds a bison horn, and we think that that bison horn is a representation that they worshiped bulls. Bulls created a lot of stability for the people. Um, they would have made clothes from the bison. They would have used the bison horn, uh, possibly to drink out of, um, possibly as a musical instrument. Uh, none of the bison would have gone to waste. She has a very well-defined set of breasts. And we think that she may have war marked a spot for worship because she was found at the entrance to the cave. Um, it's part of the puzzle as to why we think that the Venus of Willendorf was likely um, part of their belief in the afterlife. To create a detailed work of art on the side of a cave would mean that this group of people or a group of people were leaving it in a public way for others to find. Um, other art that we found inside a cave is very deeply hidden inside the cave and is not something that the artist counted on people visiting over and over again unless they were part of the community that left the cave sculpture or painting there. Um, in this case, the woman holding the bison horn would have marked a place to worship. Um, and it is further evidence that they believed in an afterlife. Uh, the horn that she holds is incised. And we feel that this is a sophisticated representation of the way stone aged tools were used, especially when you can see the bulbous um, way in which the artist created these fat rolls at the sides of the hips, um, the way that you can see the gentle curve of the flesh at the side of the body. Uh, you see this um, indentation of the waist and this hourglass shape that is so um, highly regarded in terms of women. So let's take a break and recap what we know about the Paleolithic people. Um, we know that their art took place from about 30,000 BCE to about 9,000 BCE in Western Europe. In the northern part of Spain, the southern part of France, in England, um, in Ireland, as well as in Africa. We know that Paleolithic people were nomadic and that their art 
had to be portable because they were constantly chasing the herd. We know that they were hunters and gatherers, but they relied mostly on the hunt to produce food for their community. We also know that they believed in an afterlife. The sculptures that you're looking at here are two of the largest known sculptures that have been found during the Paleolithic era in the Western world. Um, they are done in high relief, meaning that they are sculptures that are attached to the cave wall, um, but they project far enough away from the cave wall that if I reached my hand out to grab one of the legs, it's likely that my hand would be able to wrap around that leg. Um, they're about four feet long and two feet high, and they were done with an additive method versus a subtractive method. And what I mean by that, the lady from La Salle holding the bison horn was done using a subtracted method. The tool was used to chip away material from the cave wall to reveal the sculpture that was left behind. In this case, these bison were created by using an additive method. They were done with mud and moisture and sculpted in a plaster-like form. The cracks that you see within the work of art are not because they are in poor condition or because they're old. They're there because they were cre the sculpture was created with clay and water. And when water dries out of the sculpture, sometimes it causes the sculpture to crack. So I ask that you stop and think a moment about what creating a cave sculpture would be like if you were living in the Paleolithic era? What type of challenges do you think the Paleolithic people would have had in creating sculptures such as these? Maybe you have somebody at home that you could turn to and talk to about that. Just say, hey, come on over here and look at this sculpture with me and tell me what you think. Do you think, what kind of challenges do you think uh, someone who was living in the Stone Age would have whenever they sculpted something like this? All right, well... For one thing, I can tell you that these particular um, cave uh, sculptures were d found deep inside the cave. They were also found projecting from the cave wall, which means that someone had to climb the cave wall in order to create the sculpture where they did. But I also told you that this sculpture was created using a plastering technique. Okay, let's stop and wrap our head around that for a minute. What's plaster made out of? Paleolithic plaster was made of clay, which comes from the dirt, and moisture. Where do you think they got the moisture from? There's not likely a water source in the cave. There could be, but it's not likely. It's not likely because they would have had to have hiked into the cave fairly far. But um, also trying to carry water uh, that far into the cave would have been challenging. Well, one of the only places they have to get moisture from is from their bodily fluids and it's their most readily available moisture and so it's likely what they used urine or spit or something of that nature it would take an awful lot of spit to create a cave sculpture this large so we could pretty much be positive or we could pretty much go with the fact that urine was used to um, create moisture with mixed with the dirt to create this particular sculpture. 
If you look closely, you can see the incising of the beard of the bison, uh, the projecting ruff at the top of the bison's neck. You can even see the muscle structure of the bison. Because the artist used a plastering technique that creates this um, shoulder that has large sort of um, rounded bulging muscles. Uh, the artist communicates those round bulging muscles by using the plaster uh, in a C-shaped motion to create that giant shoulder along with the fat hump on the back of the buffalo's neck. Uh, these buffalo even have tails. They are a highly sophisticated representation of a buffalo. The other thing I want you to stop and think about in terms of challenges would have been light. They're going deep inside a cave. There is no natural light in this cave. They likely used fat from an animal that was carried on a bone and lit to create light to create a light source. Now remember that the image that you're looking at here has been lit by a professional photographer and so you see lots of detail. But in their time when they created these bison, they would not have had the opportunity to see this uh, to sculpt in uh, such wonderful light conditions, they would have been doing it by more of what would seem like candlelight. The other thing that um, is a challenge for the Paleolithic artist, especially the cave sculptor, is that you can only be deep inside a cave for so long because eventually you're going to run out of oxygen. Um, the bigger group of people that go into the cave, the quicker you run out of oxygen. So all of those things are challenges to the Paleolithic people in terms of creating this type of work, stationary work. Here's another representation of a, or another example of a cave relief sculpture. I know it's a little bit hard to see what you're looking at here. I've given you three different views so that you can kind of get an idea of what you're looking at. We'll start with the top view. Um, you see two thighs uh, with knees separated, hip width apart and a prominent pelvic triangle. Uh, there is an indentation for the pelvic triangle so it goes inward instead of outward. And material is scooped away from the um, graceful line of the woman's back to uh, make it prominent in the cave relief sculpture. Her arm reaches up and uh, lays behind a head, and she has um, what seem to be breasts. We know that they applied color to the cave wall, and I would think that would be to create a sense of depth so that you could um, get some contrast from the cave wall to um, so that the artist could communicate to you what he wanted you to see, which were um, the upper thighs, the pelvic triangle, the reclining back. We don't know that much about this particular cave um, relief sculpture. Uh, other than it was done with natural elements, the green element would have been some sort of element that was reoccurring in the plant material and the minerals within the cave system. This is Bison with head turned licking his back 
flank. This work of art um, is an important work of art because it represents a skill that the Paleolithic people have capitalized on. Um, and just like in the very first cave paintings that we saw, which were done on those flat slate rocks, the artist has picked up some sort of antler bone and decided that he was going to use its shape to dictate how he shows his subject matter. In this case, he's showing the bison turning his head, lifting, licking the back flank or his back side. Um, coming up with that kind of vision is a creative decision that artists even today um, I don't want to say they struggle with it but it's something that they use to challenge them to create an interesting representation of the subject and so this artist was able to represent his subject in a way that was dictated by the shape of the antler. The fact that he chooses to represent the bison licking his back flank is one that um, is very sophisticated in terms of creative composition. Additionally, in sophistication, you can see that the incising here is really sophisticated. Um, it's highly detailed. It has a vertical and horizontal pattern to it. Um, the representation of the eye is unique here. And you get a sense of the head's representation in space. In other words, the head feels as if it turns you know that the horn that is closest to its body is further away from you, the viewer. This type of representation is called twisted perspective. We get a side view profile of the bison and a three quarter view profile of the bison's head. So we call that twisted perspective. I will point out Twisted Perspective to you again and again in the next few slides. So I'll say that definition again. The Twisted Perspective or Composite View is an artistic technique that communicates visual information to the viewer in which the subject takes on more than one visual point of view. In other words, you see the side profile of the lion, but the front part of his head. I will point out many examples of twisted perspective or composite view in the next few paintings. Um, this is the bison at Altamira, Spain, and it's dated 12,000 to 11,000 BCE. Um, this painting set was found deep inside the cave system where there was absolutely no source of natural light at all. Um, we know they lit fires in the cave to create the painting. Um, and we know that paints were made from charcoal and ochre that were found in nature. They were ground up into powders and mixed with water or some sort of moisture and applied to the cave wall. So this particular work of art is fairly high up on the cave wall and you see that the bison are about five feet long. They use large flat stones as pallets and we know that they carved out crevices into the cave wall in which to stand or grab onto uh, so that they could reach high to paint the paintings. Um, we know that the images were constructed fairly quickly and we think that they took less than a day to create. 
once again, their energy needed to be conserved because they were constantly hunting for food. So why would you spend perhaps an entire 24 hours and hiking all the way into the cave and all the way back out, carving crevices in the cave walls in order to create paintings? If you weren't doing something that represented something you really cared about, like you really care about bisons enough to go all the way deep inside of the cave and paint one, remember painting really at this point is not something done for the sake of painting. It's not done because the artist just loved to paint. It's done for a specific reason. They don't have time to do anything that's just because they love doing it. Um, what we think is that they worshipped the bull and that the bull had some sort of um, connection to them into the afterlife. Um, we also think that they returned to these sites over and over again, and I'll show you some evidence of that in the next up few upcoming slides. Um, but we think they were definitely part of some sort of ritual that connected them to the afterlife. This painting is a very special cave painting. It is the very first signature in the history of art. Um, we are moving in location to the cave at Peshmerlay in France, and it's dated 23,000 to 22,000 BCE. It is an 11 and a half foot long cave painting. Um, and we know that there are about 200 sites that were recovered in southern France and in northern Spain that have cave paintings in them. Um, there were other cave paintings all over Europe, um, but the ones that we look at are from France and Spain. Um, We know that sometimes they painted paintings near a ledge. I would imagine that's because they could hold on to the ledge and paint the painting at the same time. We know that they had access to hollow plant fibers just by looking at this cave painting. I want you to stop and think a little bit about why I said we know that they have access to hollow plant fibers. I hope the answer that you came up with was that you can see the handprints are done in a spray painting technique in which the hand is laid on the cave wall and someone blew pigment through a hollow reed which um, would have covered the hand and the area around the hand and then when the artist took their actual hand off of the wall um, what was left was an image of where the hand was, used to be, before they started painting around it. I hope that made sense. Um, it's sort of like a spray gun, right? If you take a can of aerosol paint and you stick your foot on the wall and you spray your foot, uh, when you take your foot off the wall, what's left is where your foot had been. Um, in this case, it's where the hand had been. 
And you can see that there are five of these hands, which are the very first signatures in the history of art. Um, the animal is represent that's represented is a horse. Um, they are spotted horses. And they are represented in profile view. See if you can find all five signatures. I always lose one. There are four that are pretty easy to see, but then the fifth one's a little bit more difficult. You should have said that there are three above the horses, one below the belly of the middle horse, and a handprint below the belly of the horse on the right. Um, it looks to me like a lot of this particular painting was you was done using that spray gun type technique. Um, the spots on the horses as well as the um, manes look as if they've been airbrushed. Um, so what you're looking at is ancient airbrush here. These are the horses, Aruks, rhinos in the Shave cave from 3000 to 28,000 BCE or possibly 15,000 to 13,000 BCE. They are Paleolithic. These are the oldest cave paintings that have ever been found. Um, their discovery really inspired a great debate among art historians. You see, at one time, art, the art community pretty much believed that as you get closer to the modern era, meaning the year one, art gets more sophisticated because people develop more techniques, they develop more tools, they develop more sophistication um, in their art. But the discovery of this cave turned that concept on its head. And part of it has to do with a comparison between the next few cave paintings. This particular cave painting is quite sophisticated. Um, it's got more naturalistic looking animals. Um, and the animals that we see here didn't actually all exist at the same time. So when I told you that the cave paintings were paintings that we suspect communities of people returned to over and over again, it is because the animals that are represented are ones that grew extinct after a period of time. So they didn't all live together in the same time. Rhinos and Aruks did not live together during the same span of time. Um, the horses weren't always weren't domesticated um, or weren't around at the same time that the Aruks were. Mm. Um, this particular cave is really um, quite informative in terms of its naturalism. It has paintings that seem to have a sense of depth to them. That's created with that twisted perspective. You can see um, the side profile of the body of the animal, but then the artist turns the head slightly towards the viewer and shows us both horns. Um, that are on the head of the Uruk or shows you more of the face and so it looks as if the face of the animal is turning towards you. Um, the paint seems to feel as if it's somewhat mottled in that um, it gets darker as it turns across the surface uh, where the edge would uh, or where the animals uh, body would turn away from the viewer. 
So let me show you a few more cave paintings and we'll go back to this one so I can make the point that I had for you about the age and the argument about things getting more sophisticated as they move into the modern era. Uh, this is another cave painting that is from the cave system in Lascaux, France. It's dated 16,000 to 14,000 BCE. And here you see the side or a twisted perspective of a bison. It's very clear you can see the bison's head turning towards the viewer, um, but you're looking at the side profile of the bison. You're looking at a bison and a rhinoceros. Um, the bison's horn head is down and its horns are out. And you see the very first representation ever of man in the cave painting system. Um, his weapon lays on the ground beside him. It's that stick-like thing that's at the base of his foot. Um, and you can obviously see that he's a man because he has a uh, phallic symbol at the in the area of his groin. Uh, he is falling over. And then we see that the bison is disemboweled. His entrails are hanging out of his body. And so the narrative sort of develops in this painting that the man must have been hunting the bison, uh, maybe uh, speared the bison, hurt the bison enough that uh, its entrails are falling out of its body. But the bison clearly has hurt the man. Uh, because the man is laying, falling backwards, because the bison's horns are pointed at the man, it is likely that the man was gored um, while hunting the bison. Now, why in the world would you want to create a painting where this man's dying while hunting the bison? We think it was likely because they were trying to educate the Paleolithic other Paleolithic people that came after them about the dangers of hunting. Um, you know, bison are really robust creatures and if they get to feeling trapped or cornered, they will just sort of take their horns and knock them at you. Uh, in bison world, if they do that to another bison, sometimes it hurts, sometimes the other bison bleeds, but it doesn't kill the other bison. Um, well, I went to Yellowstone this summer and saw thousands of bison. Um, the very first one I saw, I was like, oh my gosh, I saw a bison. And then all of a sudden, as I saw more and more, I'm like, oh, it's only a bison. Um, it's an amazing experience. I highly recommend you go see bison roaming free in the pasture. Um, but one of the points that the park constantly made was stay at least 30 feet away from the bison. Why do they say that? Because when the bison gets to feeling cornered, the bison will take its head and shake it at you. And you want to hope that you are not in the way of that bison's horns. Uh, while I was there at Yellowstone, there was a woman who was gored by the bison and had to be rushed to the hospital, was in the ICU, and I don't know if she made it uh, because she got too close to the bison wanting to take a picture of him, and he felt cornered, and so he charged at her and threw her about 10 feet. Um, at any rate, the point being is that bison are dangerous animals to hunt, um, they're dangerous animals to take pictures of and watch. Uh, and so in this case, here is evidence that the bison is dangerous to take pictures of and to uh, hunt. Uh, you see in the left-hand side of rhinoceros, um, the artist has given great detail of what the rhino looks like from the hind haunches, as well as the front um, head and you can see um, that this drawing really is done pretty quickly. 
it doesn't give you a whole heck of a lot of detailed information. But when you compare it to the last painting we looked at, at the cave at Chauvet, you see that its date is 16,000 to 14,000 BCE. If you go back to the slide of the cave at Chauvet, you will see that those animals were dated about 30,000 BCE and were a lot more naturalistic looking and a lot more detailed. And so because of that, this argument that the bison or that the artist becomes more sophisticated over time or that art is done in a way that progresses in skill over time is just not true. What the artist wanted to represent was different. Um, this artist doesn't necessarily want to represent a naturalistic, beautifully detailed representation of the rhinoceroses and the Aruks. He's trying to educate somebody that if you stand too close, you're going to get hurt. Um, and so these paintings often, um, we look at them in terms of their skill set and think that more modern people are more sophisticated when in all reality, the painting was just done for a different purpose. They weren't as interested in relating such detailed information. This is the Hall of Bulls at the, um, in Lascaux, France. Um, they are Paleolithic and they date 16,000 to 14,000 BCE. Um, I would even argue here that some of the paintings in the Chauvet cave are a little bit more detailed than the paintings that you see here in the cave at Lascaux. Um, the Hall of Bulls was a really big deal. It was a big deal um, because it cemented that idea that art doesn't necessarily progress in sophistication over time. Um, we know that these animals were painted over a set of thousands of years because the animals that are depicted did not all live at the same time. You see animals that look like zebras, animals that look like horses. Aruks are an extinct animal that no longer exist. Um, the Hall of Bulls is massive. It is 11 feet long. Um, for a long time, the cave was a tourist site, um, but as time has gone on, tourism has caused damage to the painting, and so the French government decided that they were going to close the site down from tourism. Uh, I ask you, do you think it was right? Was it ethical, is it ethical for France to close the cave down? After all, it's a work of art that is something that belongs to the people. Um, and so I ask you, what do you think? Should the cave system have been shut down? Um, because it was being damaged. Here again, you see that composite view or twisted perspective. Um, the Uruk that sits in the front here, you can see the side profile view, but then the head turns a little bit towards the viewer where you can see both horns and part of the head. Here's a close-up detail of one of the um, renderings of the uh, rooks at the um, Hall of Bulls in Lascaux, France. Um, you can see that in this representation, there's a very natural sense to the animal. Uh, he is highly detailed. Uh, you see his body is in side profile, but his chest is in three-quarter profile view. That's that twisted perspective again. Um, and you can see the detail that was put into creating works of art with um, color. Uh, it was obviously something that took a lot of time. Um, the cave painting is high up in the cave system. 
uh, on the cave wall. And we think that this was definitely a place where people returned year after year to um, worship uh, the bull and to have a sense of the afterlife. All right, so just a recap, Paleolithic. Uh, Paleolithic cave paintings were found deep inside the caves. Uh, they used a set of tools that were um, painting devices like large stone palettes and hollow reeds to paint with. Um, twisted perspective was common. They often painted animals. There were representations and signs of humans, but the humans that were depicted were not very, there weren't very, they weren't a lot of the subject matter. Most of the subject matter we see are of animals. And at times we see a bit of a narrative, uh, a story that's being played out uh, about mankind in the paintings.